Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. All right, but let's begin reading James 1, beginning at verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forget what he's like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep one's self unstained from the world. This is the word of God. Preaching the scriptures has a variety of of challenges, right? What would be the first challenge that would come to your mind if somebody said, hey, we need you to preach next Sunday? A lot of different challenges might keep you from doing it. One of the challenges that comes to a preacher is that you're required to do your best to explain a tricky or confusing passage. Sometimes a passage is heavily debated and you're just not sure what's being communicated in the verses that you're dealt or dealing with. That particular challenge is not one we have to worry about this morning. James 1, 19 through 21 is a difficult passage, but it isn't because it's confusing. James 1, 19 through 21 is difficult because it's clear. You and I are clearly engaging with some direct commands aimed to warn each of us to repent of sin that clings so closely and instead live by faith in the saving word of God. My preparation this week has been particularly marked by temptations to abandon ship and to recuse myself as unfit to preach a passage that so clearly exposes me as a sinner. To have the call of God on your life and say to you, Drew, I want you to get up and tell these people to be quick to listen. When you know darn well that your wife has said, are you listening to me? It hurts me when you don't pay attention when I'm talking to you. I'm, I have felt unfit to preach this passage because I know I have been so quick to speak. And particularly this week, seeing so many instances of anger in various shapes and form pop out of me quickly. So, these temptations have made me want to give up preparing to preach, but you know what temptations do in a spirit-filled believer? They drive you to the cross. And I'm very, very thankful that as these temptations have driven me to the cross, I've been reminded that every preacher, at best, is a sinner saved by grace. And lo and behold, I haven't never preached a passage that I was fit to preach. Right? Sinner saved by grace, we all are. So as we engage this passage that rebukes every one of us, it is my hope that you will be struck by your own ungodly sinfulness. And moved to deeper thankfulness for what Jesus did at the cross, bearing our sin and our shame. 
just to make you aware, from the outset, even before I announce our big idea, I want you to know that I feel like I will fail you if you don't feel the weight of your sin, particularly as James points it out, and I will feel extremely like a failure if I don't point you to the cross and the Savior who went to that cross to save a sinner such as you. Title this morning, trying to be a little bit fresh and a little bit, uh, get your brains thinking a little bit. The title this morning is Basic Discipleship, colon, Shut Your Mouth and Listen to Jesus. The big idea I want you to get into your mind from this passage is this, you must control yourself and rest in God's word. You must control yourself and rest in God's word. We'll spend the first chunk of our time doing a little bit of background as we are picking up at verse 19. I want to do a little bit of back work, background work, asking a couple of background questions. And then as we dig into these three verses, I want to highlight two imperatives, two commands. Okay. Uh, I'm a person who's often tempted to discouragement and despair when a hard word like this hits me between the eyes. How do you respond when somebody says a hard word about you? It's important in life, and especially when reading Scripture, to consider the source. Some of you parents know well when your parents taught you that. Some of you parents have, are teaching your kids about this. When so-and-so on the street said such-and-such about you, mom and dad might say, consider the source. That kid says stupid stuff about everybody, right? But the same thing is true when we come to the scriptures and we hear a hard word and it might feel like a sock in the gut, we need to remember where are these words coming from. We need to consider the source. Who's responsible for these hard words that we are reading here in James chapter 1? So first, let's deal with that question. Who's writing? Okay, Who's writing? We read in James chapter 1, verse 1, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we deal with this call to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to be angry, we need to understand that these are the words of James. James's marks, James's style, James's personality is all over this letter. We believe this man, this James, to be the half-brother of Jesus. He, too, called Mary his mother. And James once thought that Jesus had lost his marbles. He thought Jesus was insane as he was going around telling people that he was the son of God. But James was later transformed by the resurrected Jesus. He didn't think that Jesus was crazy his whole life. At one point, James's mind was dramatically changed so that he believed in Jesus Christ. His half-brother was a resurrected son of God. And now James is serving the church as one of her leaders. Even if it's debated whether or not James is the half-brother of Jesus or not, we know these same things to be true. Right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whoever this James is once didn't believe in Jesus. But by God's gracious hand, James now believes in Jesus Christ. And he is serving the church. James is the human author of this letter. But he's not the original author of the message that he's presenting. James says as much in verse 1 when he writes and describes himself as a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our passage this morning, like the rest of the Old and New Testaments, were given by inspiration of God, breathed out by God. We are not simply looking at an old book written by some man that may have known Jesus. We are reading and we are discussing the very words of God. And so James 1, verses 19 through 21, like the rest of Scripture, is the authoritative and sufficient rule of faith and practice. God is the original author. God guides his church, past, present, and future, by his word. This complete and commanding word of God transformed James, and now James is sharing the word with the church. 
Okay, so now as we've considered who's writing this, we understand that God is the author, moving James, who is also one of the authors, to guide this church. And there are two things I want us to remember as we deal with this passage and its authors. And this is true, whether we're dealing with the book of James or anywhere else in the scriptures. We have to remember human author and divine author together. So the first thing I want you to remember as we get into James's words First, that these hard words come to us with the authority of God himself. While the discomfort of a rebuke like this may tempt us to ignore it, we can only ignore these words by sinfully turning a deaf ear to the sovereign Lord of all things. You're going to bump into passages of Scripture, perhaps like this one, and you're going to think, oh, I don't like that. Let's move on to something else. Or let's start thinking about all the things we need to get done this week. But the only way you can scoot past what James has said is by turning a deaf ear to God. And I wouldn't recommend that. Secondly, as this authoritative word comes to us through the human authorship of James, you and I can and should be comforted to know that these words are written to us, given to us, from a sinner just like us. James wasn't a perfect man scolding flawed people. James was a sinner who by God's help was able to speak a flawless word. But James was a sinner who found God to be merciful to sinners by lovingly warning us to turn from our sin and find salvation in Jesus. Okay? James, in particular, is one of those books that if I don't consider the source, I'll often feel like James is this guy who's got his act together, and he's come to tell me how to get my act together. And he's got this scolding tone and says, I never fail to listen, and I never speak too much, and I never get angry. You should be like me. But understand, James is a sinner saved by grace, and he's communicating to us as one who has found the gracious salvation in Jesus. It's important as we engage these difficult words to remember where they're coming from. They are the words of the one true and holy God, and, 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 they are the loving words of a fellow sinner saved by grace and through faith in the perfect work of our crucified Savior. So I want you to, can can you hold those two things together? That whenever we open the passage of Scripture, there should be a sense of authority. There should be a sense of sufficiency. There should be a sense of this is God's Word. And what it says is supremely authoritative in the whole entire world. Nothing is more authoritative than God's Word, right? We should have that sense about this passage. But we should also have the sense that God is pleased. God is gracious enough to speak through a man that he saved. To speak through a man who once thought God was crazy. To save him, to make him new, and to use him as a tool to help his bride, the church. Okay, so we've talked about who is the author. Let's do a little more background. Who's the audience? Who is James writing to as we get into chapter 1, verse 19 and following? Our understanding of this passage needs to be shaped by who James is writing to. The original audience these words have been written to is to a people in verse 1 that James describes as the 12 tribes in the dispersion. From this, we need to remember that this audience that is receiving this message are the chosen and elect people of God. They are the 12 tribes. Their faith in Jesus has cost them their comfort, and they've been dispersed from their homes and scattered in a kind of exile. James has spent most of this first chapter encouraging these Christians to endure their difficulties and their trials, knowing that God is shaping them through their hardships. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. He encourages them to go to God in prayer for wisdom with the knowledge that God gives generously to those who come to him in faith. He tells them that comfortable lives are fading away, but that their heavenly home is coming closer every day. James has spent the first 18 verses supporting and encouraging a weary and persecuted church with the knowledge of their loving God who is for them and not against them in the midst of their difficulty. James has promised them 
that they have a glorious crown promised to them by God if they endure to the end. And so what I want you to see, what's happening here in verse 19, is that there's a shift. There's a shift. James has been like Mr. Encouraging. He's been saying, hang in there. I know this is hard. God's doing good through your trials. He's there to support you. He's not against you. He's for you. Pray to him. He'll help you. And then all of a sudden, James says some hard words. And so if we forget that James has been encouraging, that these people have been weary and busted up by all the hardships, we're going to misunderstand these words. The facts that these saints are going through monumental challenges and that James wants them to persevere until the end is incredibly important. And it's incredibly important to remember as we work to rightly interpret what's being said. If we just drop down at verse 19 and forget all that's gone on already, we're going to wrongly understand and interpret what's being said. James's loving leadership has already been displayed through his teaching and encouragement. And this continues as we take note of these first words in verse 19. Verse 19 begins with these precious, loving, leading words. Know this, my beloved brothers. James's love and concern lead him to correct the church. Now I spend this time, and I know most of us are like, yeah, I don't need historical context. Get to the stuff, right? I spend this time looking into who the author is and who he's writing to because some of us think that if we're going through a hard time we don't need God's commands or that a loving pastor who's coming to us in our hardship shouldn't tell us what to do they should simply sit with us and be with us now I'm not saying anything against being a compassionate being slow with people as they're struggling. There certainly is a sense we are, where we are right as Christians, as pastors, to sit quietly with those who are hurting. But these people are hurting, and one of the things James does is he commands them. He calls them to repent. And so as pastors, we're calling you to repent. And if you're hurting, you're not excused. Does that make sense? Sometimes we can use this excuse in our own lives and we think, man, I'm going through a hard time. I'm so glad that God doesn't expect me to repent while I'm going through a hard time. Listen, if you're going through a hard time, the scriptures still call you to repent. The scriptures still call you to believe and walk rightly. Okay, Now hear me. Don't twist my words. If you're going through a hard time, it's still required of us in the scriptures to weep with you and to respond to you and the first 18 verses of the book of James should be clear that encouragement that reminding of God's promises are the first thing we need to do with those who are going through hard times but understand you can't go through a hard time that excuses you from obeying God you can't go through a hard time that excuses you from doing what the scriptures call us to do this is a particularly hard point that I want to make and I want you to understand. James encourages the weary. James encourages the beat up. And he cares for them. And he helps them. And then once he's done that, he tells them, we need to talk about how you're living. Your life needs to be adjusted and submissive to the Word of God. And so I want you to understand that these words that I've summed up with control yourself are spoken to people going through a hard time. They're spoken after encouragement has come and a reminding of God's promises have come, but yet they come. So imperative number one, control yourself. We read in verses 19 and 20, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Some people get thrown off by this translation here. They see the word, let every person be quick to hear, and some people think that this word let 
it's talking about giving permission, right? Let your brother go first. Let your sister have the toy, right? We often use the word let in light of giving permission. And so they read these words, let every person be quick to hear if they want to. Right? We have a natural reaction to see that word let and think permission. And so what James is saying here is let every person be quick to hear if they want to. This isn't, this is not what James is communicating. He's not saying if you want to, go ahead and be quiet. No, James is not communicating permission. He's communicating command. The Greek is clear that this is an imperative Verb. The NASB translates it differently. That might be more helpful to us. It's so it grabs the command. It says, everyone must be quick to hear, must be slow to speak and slow to anger. Hold this clear in your mind. James, servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, is commanding us. In James chapter 1, verses 19 and following, you are getting direct orders. James is the one speaking to them, them to us, but the orders that James is giving to us are from God himself. You are being given a command. James said back in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, that the, that the desires of our flesh tempt us to sin. Right? Do you remember that in verses 14 and 15, that we have desires? We talked about sleeping with the enemy, that the desires within us cause us to sin. So the command here is to control some of those twisted desires that James talked about. James is confronting those passions you and I have to selfishly tune out the thoughts, opinions, concerns, and instruction of other people. We arrogantly put a low value on the stuff that comes out of other people's mouths that we are supposed to be quick to listen to. We arrogantly put a low value on other people, but we think more highly of ourselves than we ought by voicing every opinion or thought that comes to our minds. The sinful flesh always thinks people need to hear our ideas. You know what's missing from this party? My perspective. We think we should be leading. We should be teaching. And those who are speaking and those who are teaching, all they ever say is stuff I already know. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. James is confronting this sinful tendency within us that says, yeah, yeah, I know where this is going. And he's confronting the sinful tendency within human beings, even Christians, that arrogantly says, my voice needs to be heard. That's not all James is commanding when he commands us to control ourselves. He's talking about listening and speaking, but he's also talking about anger. James is also confronting the fallen human tendency to be quick to anger. Every one of us is probably familiar with the popular descriptions of people who are quick-tempered or short Fused, right? These are familiar descriptors, familiar phrases, and we use them to highlight those people who are easily angered, those people who are quick to be angry. But my fear is, is that we often use these designations of people who are short-fused as a way of speaking about other people. We like to think of anger in other people as something that's quick or volatile, and we like to think of our own fuses as the appropriate length on a fuse, right? Some people got a short fuse. My fuse is like manufacturer specifications. My anger goes off, but only after an appropriate amount of time. We think that our anger has a commendable quickness. It's not too fast. It's probably about the right speed. But notice what James says. These commands are aimed at who? Every person. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person. James doesn't say, 
I'm going to take a brief aside here and talk to all you short-fused men. He doesn't say, I, I want to take a little break and talk to you, you people who like to talk all the time. No, he says, I have a command for every single person in the church. Every single person needs to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. It's not just hot-headed dads and screaming moms that need to hear this. But if you're a hot-headed dad and a screaming mom, the scriptures are speaking to you right now. But even if you're not, even if people praise your patience and praise your, your mild-manneredness, this word is for you. Let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. James is not limiting his command to those whose anger has put them in jail. James is speaking to every single Christian, even those of you we've never seen get angry. I think this is an important note to take because anger takes various shapes, different forms. It expresses itself in various different ways. And in my own struggle with anger, I've known to see I have to fight anger in different shapes and forms. Anger seems to be one of those things that you can control really well in public. And then you get home. And it's just your spouse, and it's just your kids, or it's just whatever. And boom, you are a different person. Anger explodes. Anger can look like this huge, erupting, violent thing that says, yeah, I have to get a new phone because I threw it again. Or anger can be this low-grade seething that nobody can ever do anything right. And it doesn't just flare up, it just burns all day long. Let every person be slow to anger. James is giving now good reason. He doesn't say do this because God says. He could, couldn't he? But James gives us good reason for heeding his command. He says in verse 20, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James is confronting sinful anger because it is a foundational cause for all sorts of unrighteousness and ungodliness. Anger is a flower bed in which all sorts of filth and wickedness grows. I want to say a word to those of you who agree. Are you agreeing about somebody else's anger or about your own anger? Your anger, whatever shape or form it takes, your anger is a flower bed that is producing filth and wickedness. Your anger. You understand why I was having a hard time preparing for this sermon? My anger produces filth. We've already said some words of application, but as we specifically think about applying this command to our own lives, I think it's probably best that we all respond with the knowledge that our listening, your listening, my listening is too slow. My speech is too fast. My anger is too quick some of you will be tempted to defend your too quickness especially to speaking you'll say things like well i went to seminary or i have a phd or i've read a lot of books or i have the gift of teaching or i have more kids and more experience right brian can blast the pastors from here i can do it once or twice maybe from here too <laughs> Some of us think we're older. Some of us think we have more experience. Some of us think we, we've got a right to talk all the time. Well, I've read more than you, so obviously you should be quiet and I should talk. James doesn't give 
these reasons to ignore his command, and I want to especially challenge you who consider yourselves fountains of wisdom. Those of you who think you need to be talking a lot, I want to challenge you to pursue the godly example of slowness to speak and quickness to listen. If you know so much about the scriptures, show us what it is to be slow to speak. Show us what it is to be quick to listen. Show us what it is to be slow to anger. It isn't just James that moves us this way. James is picking up on the pattern of wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Hear these cutting words. Proverbs 10 says this, When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Unless he's read a bunch of books. Is that what the proverb says? No. Proverbs 11. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Social media puts a lot of pressure, and society puts a lot of pressure to talk and to have an opinion and say something and to say the right thing and to say it quickly. But the scriptures says, a man of understanding remains silent. Proverbs 17 says, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. If you think you've got so much knowledge that you need to be talking all the time, understand that the Bible says something different. It's the knowledgeable man that knows enough to keep his mouth shut and to be a good listener. It's the knowledgeable, knowledgeable person who waits upon the Lord for the right time to speak. Proverbs 17 goes on to say, Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. Some of you may hear this command against human anger, and you might think, Hey, what about righteous anger? Didn't Jesus angrily clear the temple? And didn't Paul say in Ephesians 4, in your anger, do not sin? What about that anger? Not all anger is bad, right? You might think of righteous anger and use it to justify your anger by saying something like, I only get angry at sin. Or, I only get angry when people are selfishly foolish because I know that's offensive to God. Come on now, I know I'm not the only one that thinks this way. To that, I simply want to remind you that God is described in various places as one who's slow to anger. And if God only let his anger go when he saw sin and foolishness like you, what do you think the result would be? If God called down curses every time somebody failed to use their turn signal, what would be the result? If God only raised his voice when you sinned, what would be the result? Brothers and sisters, God has been incredibly slow toward your childishness. Do you think you should keep justifying your anger and impatience toward your children? If God has been slow to anger, toward you, do you think you should keep justifying your anger? God has been breathtakingly slow to become angry with your foolishness. Do you think you should keep losing your cool with foolish drivers or foolish neighbors or whatever other fools you encounter? Remember what I said at the outset? I'm failing if I don't put the weight on you. You don't feel like, oh my goodness, I'm a sinner and this is a hard word to hear. I also said something else there. I said I'd be an absolute failure if I didn't point you to the cross and pull you up from the depression you should be feeling right about now. At the cross, God the Son drank the full cup of God's anger and wrath. His righteous anger for our sin was completely exhausted upon Jesus. 
so that God could lead us to repentance through his kindness. Your anger and the pride that keeps you talking and rarely listening, it has offended God. But in Christ, forgiveness has been secured. He has also given us his spirit by which we are empowered to exercise and produce the fruit of self-control instead of the wretched fruits of our anger. Do you see this? Brothers and sisters, Christ came as a sacrifice for sin. Christ came as a substitute for sinners. I want you to see the beauty of Jesus, but you won't see His beauty and you won't cling to Him until you see that you're a sinner. And the more vile that sin appears, the more clearly and accurately we see the wickedness and the filth of sin, the more beautiful Jesus is. It's hard to get excited about being saved when you feel like you've been saved from a hangnail. But when you see yourself as eternally damned by an absolutely holy God, and then Jesus comes and says, I'm the Savior of the world. Oh, good news. Good news. News, understand that the cross is where Christ drank the full cup of God's wrath for us. For us. James isn't simply barking orders to be quiet and self-controlled. You need to hear that James is calling us to control ourselves. But James is also careful to point us to the salvation and the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Christ. So look with me now, lastly, at imperative number two. Rest in God's Word. Rest in God's Word. In verse 21, we read, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. James continues his call to repent of sin and to control sinful desires. He describes the whole of sin that Christians struggle with as, quote, filthiness and rampant wickedness. Hey, let's just pause there for a second. This is descriptive language. This, in a sense, is poetic, trying to stir up your affections, to stir up your imagination as you think about sin. To call sin breaking God's law is true and accurate and right. But to call sin filth hits on another level, doesn't it? It's absolutely true to call sin filth and rampant wickedness. I think it's right to see this phrase where where James is talking about filthiness and rampant wickedness. I think it's right to understand that as a clear denunciation of sin, the whole gamut of sin in our lives. It's right for James to say, you've got sin in your life and sin is filth. But I also think we need to see this phrase in light of the context. James is talking about filth and unrestrained crookedness as that which human anger creates. I said earlier that human anger is this flower bed in which filth grows. And so what James is saying about our pride that causes us to be slow to listen, quick to speak, quick to become angry, these things are filth. These things are rampant wickedness. We might look at those words, think filth and rampant wickedness. He's probably talking about that stuff that Pastor Brian's talking about in 1 Corinthians 5. Like that's filth and that's rampant wickedness. Yes. But so is your inability to close your mouth. So is your anger. These things are filth. And speaking to these things, James uses this common phrase to put them away, to put away. This is, again, another picture that James is using, this idea of picking something up, moving it, putting it away. This is a picture of what repentance is. We use the word repent a fair amount in this room. In our community, we often talk about repenting and needing to repent and and what it looks like to repent. Repent. 
And this is an image of what repentance looks like. It's easy to just use the word and not be absolutely clear what we're communicating when we say things like repent. James is using the idea of repentance and he uses the phrase to put something away. Repentance is like changing filthy clothes. It's like changing them for clean ones. It's like putting stinking, rot, rotting disobedience in the dumpster and walking away with a strong eagerness to wash your hands. Put it away. The call to repent is the call to put it away. You deal with sin like you deal with a nasty diaper. You deal with sin like you deal with that whatever it was in the bottom drawer of your refrigerator. <laughs> put it away. Get rid of it. Put it off. James isn't only calling the church to turn from sin. I want to pay careful attention to the second half of verse 21 where he uses this imperative, this command, where he says these words, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The first thing I want to highlight is what it is we are being called to receive. James calls it the implanted word. James already spoke of the word back in verse 18 where we read, of his own will God brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. When we looked at this verse a few weeks back, we talked about how God the creator spoke life. Right? He spoke the sun into existence. He spoke uh, land and sea into existence. He spoke all things into existence. And the Creator God has spoken the word of truth into the hearts of dead sinners and He created new beings, new creatures. We call them Christians, but they are new creatures. And James is talking about this word of truth that God has spoken as the word that creates worshiping saints out of rebellious sinners. So this is the context, this is what James has said about word, and so now we're talking about the word again, but we're talking about it as an implanted word. James is probably calling to mind the glorious words of the covenant that Jeremiah speaks when he proclaims the words of God in Jeremiah 31. These words of the new covenant that would be planted in the hearts of his people. We read this in Jeremiah 31, 31 and following. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. So he's talking about an old covenant that his people have broken, like a marriage covenant they've, they've broken, and God is speaking of this new covenant and how it's going to be different. I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord! They shall all know me, for the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. As James is speaking about the implanted word, he's referring to the gracious work of God by the Spirit, which causes a love for God to be planted within us, instead of written as a law outside of us. Do you see the great and glorious difference between the old covenant that was written on tablets of stone? Do this and you shall live. In the new covenant, the work of the Spirit, God has written that on our hearts. God has written that in our desires. What a remarkable difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The New Testament speaks of this covenantal implanting word as the work of the new birth. Or being born again. You remember in, in John chapter 3 where Jesus speaks to Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again. This is the implanting of the word that God does in the believer. He plants his word within us such that the law of God is written on our hearts. 
The New Testament also speaks of this work as regeneration. So when James says, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls, he's calling us to stop and remember that we have been saved by a mighty work of God, that this quick anger and this prideful speaking and failure to listen This isn't in line with the new work that God has done in us. God has made us new, and this is not the right fruit for people who have been made new. Do you see the way that this word is supposed to be received? It's to be received with meekness and humility. And that's the trouble with being slow to listen, quick to speak, quick to become angry. You have to be proud to do those things. I have to think I know better than you if I'm not going to pay attention to you. I have to think quite highly of myself to dominate every conversation. I have to think highly of myself that I always use my turn signal. Right? To be quick to... Anger means we are proud. But do you see how the implanted word can only be received by humility, can only be received by meekness? You have to stop and say, God save me for no reason in myself. I have to be humble and receive the fact, God did a new work in me. I don't deserve his loving kindness, but he has implanted his word. He has made me new. Praise God. So brothers and sisters, how are we going to move away from being bad listeners and bad speakers and carrying around this bad anger all the time? It begins by, with, by remembering that God has implanted his word in you. God has adopted you, not because you won the foot race, but because he wanted to display his love to sinners in you. He adopted you. He implanted his word in you. He has given you the new birth. He has regenerated you and made you new. It begins there. It begins with remembering the gospel. And not only a narrow understanding of the gospel to think, well, I'm saved and Jesus died at the cross, but to think that all of God, all that God has spoken to us is for our good and is a saving word. Paul speaks this way in Colossians 3. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do you handle that word let there? Is that permission? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly if you want to. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Brothers and sisters, you're not going to put sin away if you have a distant relationship with the Scriptures. You're not going to obey the commands of God if you have an easy-come, easy-go relationship with the Bible. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to remember who James is writing to. Because I think one of the terrible things that happens to us when we go through hardships is that we stumble in reading the Scriptures We stumble at memorizing the scriptures and our relationship to the scriptures becomes cold and it becomes distant. James is writing to these people and he says, let the word of Christ, let the implanted word meekly sit under this word. Humble yourselves in the midst of your hardship and receive God's word. We get this thing all messed up and out of balance if we just say, I am going to stop talking so much and I'm going to be a better listener. And I, t- today I vow to put away my anger. Well, that's partly right. But you'll have no success or you'll have strange success if you do it apart from the help of God and apart from the help of His Word. As we close, 
I just want to remind you of the picture we have of Mary, the sister of Martha, who sat at the feet of Jesus when there were many things going on. Maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, man, I've got a listening problem. I've got a talking problem. I've got an anger problem. What do I need to do? Well, first and foremost, remember the gospel. But if you can have this picture in the midst of your hardships or in the midst of your easy life, whatever it might be, Jesus said of Mary, who got scolded by her sister for not working hard, Jesus said, Mary has chosen the good portion and it will not be taken away from her. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, humbly receiving whatever he wanted to say. She was quick to listen to him, slow to speak. And even when Martha was slandering her and making her look awful in front of the guests, she was slow to anger. So brothers and sisters, I want to commend to you Mary as one who seems to be obeying what James is trying to bring up in the church. One meekly sitting under the word of God, able to save your souls. Let's pray.